So we have been integrating AI into all our teaching since uh, the start of the first semester, as you can see here. And uh, there were uh, three kinds of student responses. One was, wow, most of them said, wow, this is incredible. This changes everything. The second was a few were very angry, screaming at me and saying, this is bad, <laughs> this cannot happen. And then another few, most also had a bit of confusion, especially about what am I going to do? You know, what is my role now? By the way, one person on this slide is a real human, which one? Let me guess. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're guidance, you're yes. 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 It's our model. <laughs> <laughs> our model is the only real human. All the others are AI generated. Um, so I, I gotta tell you this. And um, this was some student reflection at the end of last semester. And I wanted to read this. When I started reading this, the experience had been both positive, positive and negative. I thought, oh no, another negative person or something. And if you read this, I think. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's not him. <laughs> and he's obviously not a PGL student, of course. Huh? And not, not a PGL uh, topics are boring or outdated. But this is sort of the response that you will get, though, I think, if we don't embrace AI into our teaching. And that's um, what uh, I'm going to talk about today. Because I think it promises a lot. It promises a lot of personalized learning with AI as a tutor, and it really easily follows up on the hybrid teaching that we've been doing. Yes, technology enhanced. Um, it's online face-to-face. -face. Uh, large language models come into that model uh, very, very easily and uh, lead to breakout learning. If you see there, Khan, Khan Migo from the Khan Academy, you may have seen the video of that and how they're using now AI also as a personal tutor. So there's optimism and there's concern. We all know that, and I don't want to talk about the, the future that is ahead of us that will take a lot longer than eight minutes. So I want to just talk about what we have been doing now, and, and it is a present reality. And we have not banned it, so we at Innovation and Press have integrated it into our teaching. Uh, students have to use it, <laughs> have no choice. And so we mandatory, uh, make it mandatory for them to use AI in their assessments. That may shock a few people, maybe. Um, we do that because we believe that AI is going to change the way they're going to work after uh, uni and the way that they will be working as a knowledge worker. And I come back to that. This was last week. Yes, I presented there. Um, and I came, I arrived at one o'clock in the morning and I was uh, presenting the next morning. <laughs> there was a, there was a, a fast roller coaster ride. And I've also been asked to, to do a submission to the Committee of Art on Artificial Intelligence. I'm uh, just about to finalize that one as well for, for tonight. COB is the, the, the final uh, date for that. And the reason for that is that uh, Vishal Rana, Rana, my colleague who's now left to go to Griffith, and I have been doing a lot of publications and work into AI recently. Here you see four blog publications that we've done for the London School of Economics impact block since April only, and there's a fifth one coming up very, very uh, closely. Um, and that is, and, and we've done other work as well uh, for webinars and, and talks and et cetera. And it's all because there's a lot of interest because we do something with AI, right? We are uh, implementing it into our uh, teaching and not many people do that yet. But how are we doing that? We use it for experiential learning, design research, um, creative and critical thinking, reflection skills, and also improving tone and style of students' writing. So isn't that then cheating, right? That's the question, don't they just, if they use AI, this is what students ask me all the time, isn't that cheating to use AI? Because all the other teachers tell us, you know, you're not allowed to use it because it's cheating. But I'll be saying, yeah, there is a lot of chance, there's a lot of opportunities for cheating as in essays, reports, in unsupervised quizzes, and coding assignments as well, creative writing. It's, AI is doing a very good job of all that. But we see an opportunity. We don't want to look at it from a cheating perspective. We say, okay, if we do it well, we, we, we use AI in the right way, then uh, it can enhance your learning. And uh, that may then uh, be done through the experiential learning that we do already and the authentic assessment that we do. So, so all our students um, 
working projects that are real world projects. And that means and that makes it a lot more difficult to just get AI to do your work because they talk to real people and they talk to real projects and, and AI doesn't know about real people yet. Yeah. I, have, I think all I think I have to say yet after every sentence when I talk about AI, I cannot do something yeah, yet. And so I tell my students, the burden of proving the age of AI has changed. Yeah? You need to provide evidence that you are not a robot. So if you submit something without any evidence in it, I think you're a robot and you will not pass the assignment. And so that means that they will have to be taught about the process of learning. And every time they do something, every time they prompt something, they make an, a screenshot of that and uh, copy that into the attachment and refer to that in their uh, assignment. And so they learn about providing evidence of their work all across their learning journey. And we assess that as well. We assess their learning journey and process and outcomes at the same time. Of course, it's much more uh, resource intensive and um, has to, has to, I think has the potential to make us very competitive if we at Flinders would all do this, uh, because I think uh, students would really be interested in joining something like that. But it has also consequences for the education, higher education business model, which um, I cannot go much deeper into in eight minutes. So why is all this? Well, because large language models have a lot of capabilities, right? They can do a lot of things very well. Um, maybe not so well yet in certain, certain areas, but they are improving very quickly as well. And we found out that these skills that large language models have epitomize the expertise of knowledge workers worldwide. And even my own era, this is just from the last few months, four papers in innovation and creativity uh, on how AI can help us make more creative, more innovative, and outperforms humans in creativity tests, etc. So it's not just data analysis or the boring stuff, it's also the fun stuff, which I think makes us more concerned about what we humans see as meaningful work if the fun stuff is also being taken away from us. And another concern for me is that knowledge work is then under the threat, right? Concerns about job security, social economic inequalities are real, and I think that's going to happen next year. There's no doubt, especially in certain areas, there will be layoffs. And I'm concerned about it. I wrote, we wrote an article about it as well. So our idea is that um, we can discover meaningful work. Though. We can say, OK, let's then look at workflows and say, well, what workflows, which workflows are distinguishing the AI and which ones are very human? And we have some examples there where AI would be automating your team tasks and providing actionable insights and supporting the creative process and aiding in data analysis and decision making, where humans do, they are more into co-creating and providing contextual understanding. AI cannot go outside yet, <laughs> again, not yet. It cannot get the contextual understanding of the real world. And we can edit and we can uh, facilitate the implementation of the AI output and also co-create and, 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 and for that we need interpersonal skills right, that lead to collaboration and synergy and serendipity, that kind of skills. And that means that we believe, as Michel and I, we believe that the role of humans evolves from creators, managers and administrators to becoming co-creator, an editor and facilitator. I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. <laughs> and it follows the process of co-creation, revision and implementation. Yeah, that is a constant process. That is the constant process that people go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, co-create, edit, facilitate, co-create, edit, facilitate. And there's, and we need to teach our students that, that's number one, obviously. And we need, for that, we need to shift the, the, the paradigm in higher education, I believe. Um, we need to teach those competencies, those roles, um, where the student and the, and the worker is the pilot. I see us as having agency over this. We are the pilots, we control it. So them, our students, you are the one who is in control. You decide what to use from AI and what not how to provide evidence and how to reference it. Um, and AI is our co-pilot. Co it's, a, it's a very young intern that is extremely smart, right? It, it passes the bar exam in, 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 the, in the US for, 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 uh, for lawyers in, in the 92 percentile. So it's extremely smart. But it's also very young and un, unknowing and makes the, uh, mistakes still as well. So you need to constantly be on top of it and use your knowledge to um, co-create with it. But I think then it will lead to a meaningful engagement. And so this is the last slide. Uh, how, just an example of how I, 
uh, integrated into our teaching and how I teach our students about this. These are some prompts that I give them. This is an exercise that they can do when they start their empathy research. Um, they start with phase one, understanding the challenge, um, and then they co-create an edit, and that's what I tell them. You co-create an edit here. So you get you co-create something, you update GPT uh, something, and you get it back, and you edit that again, and you bring it back in. Then you have some detailed exploration where you dig deeper. And again, you co-create and edit, and you then implement it potentially into uh, reality as well. And that goes on like that. Analyze solution, you co-create and edit. And then that, until finally in phase five, uh, they have their uh, empathy questions that they do in the empathy research, uh, in the empathy interviews. And uh, they will then uh, facilitate it into reality and start asking real people in homelessness, for example, what are the issues in homelessness, I mean, sure, I got these open questions that I made with ChatGPT. Uh, Where in the past, students really struggled with that. Now, we very quickly uh, create something that gives them a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding about what to ask and why. And uh, my um, experience in the first semester was that uh, their outcome, because of that, is much better, it's higher quality. And the uh, interviews are much more interesting to listen to. So that is my... Final slide. My final thing I want to say is that we uh, organized again with uh, Michelle uh, Picard. We organized a conference on October 28 uh, here at Flinders, and I ask everybody to join us with that. Please join the discussion. Um, I'm also experimenting here. That's why I think I love this so much. It's purely uh, experiential learning. It's purely innovation. It's it is learning by doing, and it suits me very well. Um, but I'd love to hear your opinions and your insights on this as well. So thank you very much. This was it for me.